Hello, Internet. My name is Camomile. And I'm Fortuna, the Roman goddess of luck. Uh, Cam, have you seen Requiem anywhere? I was looking for him. Uh, he was just here a second ago, but... Oh, man. He tried to fix the lottery again, and I just, I'm done with him. Like, I, I tried to, you know, give him some ironic punishment. I gave him a monkey's paw. His first wish was for the paw to have infinite fingers. Uh, and then he, I, like, he wished that all of the pots would... I how he's been able to make that many wishes. <laughs> so this, yeah. is, this is explaining a lot. I figured he eventually wished for something that would, you know, destroy him and I would get my revenge. But then his second wish was that for all the consequences of the monkey's paw to affect you instead. You know, as the uh, Roman goddess of luck, I also have a background in literary criticism. That makes sense. Roman gods and literary criticism are both things that people talk about in college, so. So Netflix is getting sued because they're doing a Sherlock movie. Not because they can't do a Sherlock movie, but because the Conan Doyle is stake that uh, Sherlock Holmes having emotions is still under copyright. One thing I love about the uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle is he writes this very logical detective, and he was also, he was himself very gullible. You know the Cotlington fairies? Yeah. Yep. He was a big advocate of that. And he was, he did all this while simultaneously being friends with uh, Harry Houdini, who was a noted skeptic. I just imagined him the whole time being like, Arthur, you, you know none of this can be real, right? And it was specifically Titus's look, like Yuna's look, and well, Titus is in the, the main villain who because of his design, it looked like he had a giant pot belly. A pot belly with a six pack. It was weird. Like that was kind of like the uh, nadir of the, the aesthetic, but they've. I mean, you call it the nadir. I absolutely loved it. Like <laughs> the criticisms of it are not wrong, but it is. It is one of those things where I love it because of how bad it is. Like. It's like the, the Batman and Robin uh, movie, and the whatever they called the one with Two-Face and Riddler, where, like, yeah, those movies have a really ridiculous aesthetic, but they know exactly what they're trying to be, and they're being that, and I love it. It is the dream of the dark side of Kyrie's heart. Uh... You're about 70% accurate. I mean, the Sword in the Stone is the origin story for King Arthur, and like most origin stories, you know, it's an important part of telling a complete beginning to end, uh, you know, Uther to Camlan recounting of the Legend of King Arthur. But outside of that context, it's one of the weaker stories. You know, it's a lot like Uncle Ben's death, where it's like, unless you are setting out to tell a complete story of Spider-Man, skip that. Even with stuff like gender, women had a lot more agency in the Middle Ages than people realize. And, like, the Renaissance is when, like, in our language, we start to see the language get changed to sort of subordinate women. Like, that's when you get... The, in our language now, man has this weird double meaning where it's all humans, but especially male humans. Right. At the time, man just meant all humans. Uh, you were a... A with or aware, uh, with is a female human, aware is a male human. Uh, Which, by the way, I support going back to wearmen, just on the grounds that it sounds fucking badass. <laughs> like in Victorian literature, there was a common trope of you having like the main character having like an aunt or uncle who grew up in like the Georgian or Regency era, who was kind of decadent and is thus embarrassing to the family because they grew up at a time when things were a lot more open. I don't know why you're surprised by this. That gets back to what we talked about last time with uh, the notes on camp. Uh, Which I what did you think of that? Uh, so about half a paragraph in, I was like, oh right, this is why I hate academia. I think she is wrong about that things cannot intentionally be camp. Uh, I think it is possible 
to say, like, you know, I know this is dumb, and I'm playing it straight anyway. That is a, you know, the uh, person who had the first read notes on camp, that was also his contention. Uh, he pointed to John Waters' movies as being intentionally camp uh, and succeeding. It's so long as you have a sincere love for the dumb thing you are doing, uh, I think you can make it camp. The, probably the high, height of gay coding, uh, of actual gay coding, is in the 50s and the 60s. You'll see all sorts of, like, winking references to gay culture. Like, uh, there is infamously a uh, Western movie that uses the word gunsel, which and doesn't really explain what it means. And in gay culture, it just meant it was uh, the submissive partner in sex. But because they don't explain what it means within the context of the movie, in Westerns, it just turned into a young gunslinger. You also have like popular songs referencing the fact that everybody's gay now. There's a song called uh, from the 1920s called Let's All Be Fairies, talking about how it used to be there were just two fairies and now it seems that everybody's a fairy. I really wish you could side with the Heartless. Just start destroying worlds for them because they're so cute. <laughs> Get anything that adorable be evil. I'm kind of reminded of the uh, the definition of antihero, which is a villain who's hot. <laughs> when you can't see their health bars, or can you? Uh, yeah, no, I have that ability now. Oh, so. Yeah. I just figured if you can't see your health bar, like you can't target one you've been targeting, so it makes it harder to. Uh, yeah, eliminate. no, I am focusing fire on one of them, but like they keep getting in each other's way, and uh, after they get sufficiently damaged, they switch to a second, much harder move set, which oh. is still pretty easy to deal with in isolation. But uh, the problem is when a whole bunch of them start using it, because Goofy doesn't know how to focus fire. Right. Neither does Donald, but Donald spends most of his time unconscious, so it doesn't matter. So when you get to the level where you have to choose to save one of them and the other one's going to die, you're definitely choosing Donald. I mean, not Donald, uh, Goofy. Yeah, okay, these crates are not taking damage. There is a little red trinity behind there, and there is the bell. But it is just blocked off inexplicably, so there is something I need to do to make those crates go away. I have no idea what it is. So, why don't we use the power of the internet? I mean, I don't think either of us are skilled enough to uh, access that power, are we? We're out of other options, so we're going to have to do something desperate. Also, aren't you a god? No, wait, you should be able to. Yeah, I mean, that's... that's. Okay, here's what here's what the top voted answer is. You need to seal the keyhole and beat the bosses in Deep Jungle and Wonderland, which you did. Talk what? to Sid at the accessory shop and deliver the book to Merlin, then talk to Sid again. Okay, so I have to go talk to Sid again. That... <sighs> People took a look at Sora and were like, hey, you look like a main character. I've got a bunch of uh, chores I need done. I mean, if they would just tell me what chores they need done, and then I could go do them, this would have gone a lot faster. <laughs> the problem is that I have to hunt down which people need their chores done before the main plot will move its mystery crates out of the way so I can advance it. This whole episode is going to be just uh, wandering around Traverse Town, trying to find out how to get those indestructible crates to move. <laughs> Riveting, I'm sure. And you already talked to Leon, and there's not another way to talk to Leon. Slash Squall. Which I guess I'll go and talk to Squall again. Maybe I just have to talk to him twice. That would be so dumb. Oh my god, that was it, wasn't it? I'm just grating so hard against my instincts to run past these guys instead of killing them all. So yeah, now I can summon Simba. Uh, this will never be useful. So I have a game theory. Hey, hey, cut it out. I think that Riku 
our uh, childhood rival who was very blasé about uh, using the power of the darkness. This is going to sound crazy. You're going to be like, Fortuna, He's there's no way this could happen. <laughs> that was my second theory. <laughs> I'm my sure first theory, my first game theory is he's going to turn evil. Like, I know that sounds crazy. Like, how could that ever happen? But I think he's going to turn evil at some point. I mean, I have to assume you used your god powers to figure that one out because it was an absolutely shocking twist. Um, Wait, I thought 1.5 was the final mix, but they're two different things. No, yeah, there was Kingdom Hearts. There was the final mix. Uh, and then there was 1.5, which included the final mix update, and I think some additional rebalancing. Oh my god. And also, cool symbols appear on the fountain every time you ring. But then, if you go down to look at them, you have to fight your way all the way back up. So definitely don't. Take it away, Gabe! Hello, Internet. My name is Chamomile. And I'm Requiem. Sorry okay. about missing last time. Yeah, uh, you just missed Fortuna. Um, oh! But we, uh, we, we need to have a talk about the monkey's paw. What, what about? So, uh, while Fortuna was on the show, she said that... You, your second wish on the monkey spot was that all of the side effects should happen to me and, and not you. That doesn't sound like me. You can't, you can't believe, why would I ever do that? Have I ever, like, gotten you involved in, like, dark occult stuff that has ended up backfiring on you? I hate to bring up the Jade Empire playthrough again, but yes. If we're getting into it, there's also, like, the time when you sent me a bunch of coupons for that Needful Things store and told me not to Google it, and I didn't. And I feel like I probably should have. They were good deals. Yes, were you briefly a Wendigo? Yes. But I got you down eventually. I mean, I feel like the only positive that really came out of that long term is that ownership of my soul is now such a legal clusterfuck that I don't know if anyone's going to be able to collect. A plague has wiped out most of life on the planet in The Last Man, which is written in 1826. So we've kind of we've had, we've had that idea in our culture for a while longer than people actually realize. Like it's one of those things I think thing people uh, assume is rooted in the uh, post nuclear age when we right. have first have that weapon. But you also have to remember Mary Shelley lived through uh, the year 1816, uh, 18, which is also known as 1800 and froze to death, which was a volcano in I want to say Indonesia erupted and disrupted the seasonal cycle across the across the world uh and it would snow in the middle of the summer and there were crop failures that's when uh she and uh percy shelley and lord byron hold up in the castle and uh that's when you also you get uh frankenstein and you get uh you also get the vampire by polidori but she did experience this quasi-apocalyptic event like there were crop failures all throughout Western Europe and North America because of the uh, seasonal disruption. I mean, if it was the early 19th century and it was snowing in the summer, I would assume it was the end of the world. So here's a question, Camille. Yes? What text did the story of Aladdin originate in? See, I feel like you wouldn't be answering that. You wouldn't be asking me that if the obvious answer were correct. <laughs> but uh A Thousand and One Arabian Nights is the 
answer that springs immediately to my mind. I never did get around to reading that. I've been meaning to for a while, though. Well, that is the obvious answer, and you are correct about me not asking the question if the obvious answer was correct. It did not originate in the Knights. Uh, that was added by the first uh, European translator. Uh, See, at some point, you gotta, like, you know, throw me a curveball. Like, so, where do you think you know, the, the Star Wars universe originated from. And then it's like, well, it would be with, you know, the first Star Wars movie in 1974, wouldn't it? And you'd be like, yeah. So, like, we're doing Aladdin, so at some point we're going to obviously run into the genie, which is kind of like the Islamic concept of the jinn. But, like, in the West, uh, we've really focused in on the wish-giving thing, which is not really the main component of the jinn as a part of folklore or religion. Like, you run into a djinn, it's not, you're not necessarily going to have a story about wishes. Like, that's a thing right, that yeah. in the West we focused on. Like, there's one story in the Thousand and One Nights. I don't remember everything that happens in it, but this guy digs up a jar, and he opens the jar, and there was a djinn in it, and it's just like, I'm going to eat you. And he convinces it not to eat him, but, like, it wasn't obligated to grant him wishes. Here we see Aladdin making excellent use of his wishes getting rid of some random Heartless that we were just slaughtering a minute ago. From Celtic Foreign Lua, you get the, the sea day in the unseen world of Anwen. You're, you're doing that on purpose. The Victorian explanation for things like the Shi and the Jinn is that they were a uh, earlier people that was displaced by a newly arrived people. So in the case of the Shi, it was the belief that this was a pre-Indo-European people that were wiped out by the Celts. Uh, but the thing that we've run into, like, is you run into these people, this folkloric creature pretty much all over the world, even in places where the current inhabitants are the first inhabitants. So, like, in Hawaii, the first people to inhabit Hawaii were the, are the indigenous Hawaiians. Uh, they were the first people there, and they have the story of the uh, Menahune. There are uh, the harpies. Uh, they they are the spirits of sea winds, and so, you know, if you are a Greek on a boat and something is blown out of your hands and into the sea, then you would say that the harpies had snatched it from you in their invisible talons, and like I don't think anyone has ever tried to claim that the harpies are you know secretly uh, displaced indigenous people that uh, the the main Greek people conquered or destroyed, but that's the kind of thing where it's like, that, that's the kind of thing that humans invent an invisible creature for. Part of the issue was that people were uh, taking the Book of Invasions, which was a medieval Irish text, way too literally. And the Book of Invasions describes a process by which you have these various invasions of Ireland by people that eventually the Malathians show up, and that's the Irish people, and they drive the other people underground. But what people miss is this is an Irish monk writing in like the year 1100. He's not, he's not actually writing Celtic mythology or Irish mythology. He's, it's been centuries at this point since anyone believed in the Irish gods. And he was specifically trying to you hemorrhize it. He was trying to take what he knew and turn it into a historical narrative. So we don't know how much of this was actually something the Celts believed. We don't know. Well, he also the idea was that, like, it, which you can tell because there are there, there's a couple of times where what is clearly the same story happens like two or three times spaced far apart in the timeline because he apparently yeah. liked both versions of the telling and decided to just include them both. The criticism I've heard of the anti celticists is the anti celticists want to pretend that Ireland springs up fully formed out of the ocean in the Middle Ages with the arrival of St. Patrick. And, like, even if, like, the Celtic arguments are sort of overemphasizing the continuity of Celtic culture, like, there's still stuff unique to Ireland. Ireland existed before the arrival of Christianity, and it had its own separate culture before that happened. And when Christianity arrives, it's going to take on unique aspects because it's mixing with this separate culture. The small gods theory, essentially, that a lot of, sometimes these are, like, pre-Christian gods that have been forced into a different context by the arrival of Christianity. 
there comes a tipping point in history, which is relatively recent, only a few centuries ago, when you can expect to, like, you know, you, you can expect to have an explanation for a natural phenomenon. Like, you are more likely than not going to be able to explain a natural phenomenon in your life. Uh, and for most of human history, this was not true. For most of human history, the majority of natural phenomenon were inexplicable. And once that tips over, like, it makes a big difference to the way people perceive the world. <laughs> also, that is like the worst Robin Williams impression. <laughs> yeah, no, this, this there's a terrible Robin Williams. I mean, I feel bad for anyone who has to play the genie, um, whether they're trying to do a Robin Williams impression or not. Heaven is past the moon, and when I say it's past the moon, I mean that literally. Like, if you were able to get past the moon, you would be you'd be able to meet God and all the angels. Like, and it wasn't really an issue for most of history because, like, we couldn't even really see past the moon. But in, uh, like, in Serrano de Bergerac's uh, The Man in the Moon, like, it features uh, the main character. Uh, he gets in a hot air balloon and flies up to the moon and he talks to an angel. So uh, we know now, like, obviously, just past the moon, they're just space. So obviously heaven's an alternative dimension. That's how you explain it. Uh, right. We know you can't have, like, a physical creature that's made out of air, so you can't explain demons as though, oh, they're made out of air. So you're like, oh, they're made of some sort of, like, spiritual substance that's not explainable in physical terms at all. Reenchantment. Being used, And there are some places left uh, like that in the world, but there's so few that it becomes a little bit incredulous that, uh, no, the enchantment is hiding here in the Mariana Trench, guys. The last place we checked, that's where the enchantment is. You even see this a little with, like, early science fiction, because a lot of it'll... It starts out, the setting is Mars, instead of, like, some far-off other unexplored planet. Like, uh, the Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury, we we go to Mars and we find this Martian civilization. Or, uh, John Carter of Mars, uh, does the same thing, basically. But now Mars is disenchanted, it's just rocks. Yeah, pretty much the entire solar system. I do think Mulan is the last one before they start getting into, yeah, Home on the Range and Chicken Little, which again, very good DreamWorks movie. I don't know why Disney made it. <laughs> I'm just imagining, you know, Dr. Facilier sitting at that, and I have no idea which one of us is pronouncing his name correctly for the record, uh, but I'm imagining him, you know, sitting at that empty table, and then like, you know, Rasputin just kind of comes in, sits down, like one of them coughs. <laughs> is it, is it just us? So there's Adventures from the Book of Virtues, which I have never heard of. Yeah, not ringing any bells. Oh, it's based off the William Bennett book, so probably don't want to touch that. <laughs> <laughs> Anastasia, which we talked about. The Prince of Egypt. So, you know, I guess uh, God can show up as a Disney villain. <laughs> I want an Angel of Death boss fight. And then you get Titan AE, which I also don't think I've watched. Oh my god, no. Titan AE was amazing. Oh? Yes. I mean, it was visually stunning, which <laughs> I think is good enough. But So I think, uh, you know, we've got some good choices for villains, right? Uh... I want to make a joke about Ice Age villains, but I can't remember any. I assume we just fight a glacier or something. So, I'm guessing the Princesses of Heart are going to be uh, Alice, obviously, Jasmine, um, probably Sailor Moon. Hello, Internet. My name is Chamomile. And I'm the Queen of Air and Darkness. I mean, Requiem. I'm Requiem. Uh, I, I'm not also the Queen of Air and Darkness. We are two separate people. Fun fact, I have just now remembered that, hey, I have a Keyblade upgrade and have for, like, the past hour. We're going to go ahead and equip that. My first wish, Jean. Show me the keyhole. And what do you care? You know it's in this room. Your only goal is to make sure it doesn't get sealed. There's a 
whole discussion of how much this game rests on uh, keys and keyholes that you could have a Freudian analysis of, but I think we'll just leave that one aside <laughs> for now. Yeah, no, we'll wait until the game when Sora turns 18 to have that conversation. <laughs> Let's get into the thing where, for me at least, I have find it uh, very hard to get invested in romances if I'm not already invested in the characters. I'm not really invested in Kyrie at all. Yeah, uh, like, they set aside the time for it, but the problem is that she didn't really, she wasn't really anything except for a quest ATM. Yeah. Like, we talk to her, but she doesn't say very much. Which, like, you know, I could I have, not describe I, her personality. <laughs> I have this running joke about how Sora and Riku are, you know, my OTP. And partly that's a forward reference to Kingdom Hearts 2, when their relationship actually gets explored a lot. But it's also partly... Uh, it's because they have really well-developed personalities and, like, a relationship dynamic with each other, even in Kingdom Hearts 1, in a way that neither of them really have with Kairi. The fun thing about the genie in this fight is that because he is under Jafar's control, he is required to try and attack, but, like, the whole theme is that his heart isn't really in it, which means you can just ignore him for the whole fight. Because, <laughs> like, his attacks are so inaccurate that uh, and so infrequent. I like that. <laughs> that you can basically just ignore him. I think Ursula has the best villain song. Like, I don't think Oh, it's so talk. good. Like, there's subtlety there. Like, you know, she's making this devil's bargain, and you can feel the pitch, right? Like, like yeah, if I, I really wanted what she was offering, and I was a dumb 17-year-old, I could absolutely see myself falling for that against my better, you know, against my better judgment. Which, you know, Ariel, like, winces as she signs the contract. She knows this is probably not a good idea. She's just kind of desperate. And also, she has an abusive father. Which, you know... So she's kind of operating out of pure spite, which I can respect. In the original Aladdin... He... Aladdin tricks Jafar into making this wish... That backfires on him. Because, you know, apparently every single genie is bound to lamps in this universe. Uh... <laughs> Whereas in this version, you know, Genie is just like, uh, Jafar is just like, well, why didn't I do this in the first place? This is much better than just being a regular wizard. Talking about the, the transformation of the uh, Jin to the Western Genie. Uh, suggested that the focus on the wishes is related to uh, capitalism and sort of the capitalist need for sort of to be able to infinitely indulge sort of material wishes without necessarily having to do labor for it, which I thought was oh. an interesting interpretation. I mean, interesting, yes, but I do have to take issue with it, just because, I say infinitely, but one thing that comes up in the Western version, the Western retellings, that is not so often present in the originals, is the finite nature of the wishes. That is an interesting point. <laughs> Because uh, in the originals, which, and I have, you know, I have read a couple of translations of the originals here and there. I have never made the proper study of them that I have wanted to. So I'm not speaking from the level of authority that I like to. And even that level of authority, to be clear, isn't like, you know, doctorate level or anything. Uh, but, to my understanding, though, it is that... Uh, it is the westernized versions that tend to have three wishes, and uh, the original versions tend to have uh, just, you know, as long as you have the lamp, the ring, the whatever it is that has bound the genie, um, so long as you have that, you can command any amount of wishes from them. They are, you know, a slave of the lamp, or whatever. This is hell. <laughs> We're being punished for our sins. But, mainly just because to save time. Um, but, there, 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 there is... I said that word the same way, with the exact same cadence. Am I a fucking robot? But... Are you? Are you the real first. chamomile? Did you get replaced by a robot at some point? Beep. I mean, yes. 
Okay, you know what? You know what? Here's what I'm, we're going to do to figure out if you're the real Cam. I'm going to ask you a question that only the real Camomile would know. All right? All right, go for it. Okay, so what 2005 anime uh, established the genre of reverse harem slice of life animes and brought about a renaissance in that genre, not only in Japan, but in the West? Uh, that is very obviously Gundam Wing. Uh, famous for its protagonist, uh, Relena, and the the five cute boys that she had wacky slice of life adventures with, and absolutely no mech battles at all. I realize uh, I would just normally ask you what the uh, answer to that question was, so I guess we're fine. Yeah, well, the answer was correct. And if we were both imposters. We would definitely not be wondering if maybe we should just, like, be open about that, since who are we even impersonating for at that point? Yeah, the other cool thing about uh, the attention to detail is that you can see that the design of Monstro's insides were very attentive to real-world whale anatomy. Oh, well, there it is. See, for uh, reasons that are totally unrelated to magic, uh, sometimes physical objects near me will uh, become self-aware and wander away. Um, so is my keyboard the... walked off. Uh, is that but... what the Internet of Things means? Yeah, yeah. You know, we've decided to make all objects sapient. I had a very different understanding of that term, but I guess that makes sense. The Moogle Shop, right? Yeah. They had Dalmatians just sitting in their shop. Bear in mind, they are on the same world as the Dalmatians' home. And they just had these Dalmatians in a box. Uh, possibly asphyxiated. I still haven't checked. <laughs> like, what the hell, guys? Googles are adorable but bloodthirsty. So you can tell Riku's jealous of Sora. Or not jealous. He's, he's bitter about being rejected by Sora who he assumes is now dating Goofy. <laughs> uh, and so he's going to go date Kairi to try and make Sora jealous. Yeah, the first three games, mainline games, and all of their various uh, plot-critical spin-offs in Kingdom Hearts are called the Zehanort Saga because they are about this guy named Zehanort who at some point possesses or transforms into almost literally every major character. Amazing. But his yeah, original yeah. identity is actually Walt Disney. So, we went into the throat, then climbed upward, which got us sucked into the stomach. Heart or no heart, at least he still has a conscience. The exact function of the heart is... You might not hear it, but right now it's pretty, uh... Clear. Pretty vague. Hey, you're on the wrong side! Then you leave me no choice. I believe, and I don't know if this has been confirmed by science or not, but I believe the pump blood through your body. I mean, it's like that time we both got swallowed by a whale at the same time. And you were like, I wonder if this stomach acid hurts me. And I was like, chamomile, it's stomach acid. And, you know, that's how, like, I told you. Okay, but in my defense, it was a baleen whale. <laughs> and uh, there was no particular reason to believe it could digest things larger than krill. The technology to skip cutscenes just wasn't there yet. How, about it, Sora? How do you feel Let's about being led into everlasting same. darkness? We can do I'm not gonna make it. <laughs> oh. oh, I guess I'm okay. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, he is just... So that means, so he's essentially omniscient because he can just say any statement, any true or false statement and determine the truth of it by whether or not his nose grows. Hello, Internet. My name is Camille. And I used to have a name, but due to unforeseen circumstances, I lost it. Lost it? Are we talking about, yeah. like, you know, lost it in a gambling game? Or, like, you misplaced it. I sold it. Okay. What, what did you get for it? 
I got a couple of magic flowers. Magic how? I, I don't know. I just know they're magic. Okay. And was I involved in the negotiations at any point? Like, of course not. Like, look, I was walking in the woods and there was this guy and he was dressed all in green and he had green skin and horns. And he was like, hey, would you like some magic flowers? I was like, sure, I will give them some to my friend Chamomile. He was like, yeah, all I need is your name. Okay. And I was like, sure. So I gave him my name and I got the flowers and they are on the way to your apartment. Bam. Cool fish episode. Here we go. Cool fish. Cool fish. Uh, so, so not too long ago, we were on Aladdin's World, where we were pretty open about there being other worlds that Aladdin wasn't allowed to come visit us with. And now we're suddenly all Prime Directive here. It almost makes me wonder if each of these worlds was written by, like, a different person. The thing about the uh, Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale is it's very, very explicitly Christian. Uh since the Little Mermaid, the reason she wants to a man to a human man to fall in love with her is because that's the only way to get an immortal soul. Is if the uh, man marries her, some of his soul will go into her, and she'll have an immortal soul. Uh, otherwise, after three hundred years, she'll die and turn into sea foam. You think we should set the seashell at the bottom of an ocean trench on fire? It is red. And the sad thing is, you're right. Yeah, you know, there, there's something to be said. Like, you know, you, you can potentially mislead people about uh, how certain ancient cultures, pre-modern cultures, uh, told stories and you know thought and believed. Uh, but that really only happens if you're making very small changes, because then the changes are not easily detectable to an audience. Whereas Disney does such drastic overhauls, like a random audience member can reasonably be expected to understand that the Disney version of a fairy tale uh, has potentially been significantly cleaned up compared to the original. Also, Triton is an abusive father, don't at me. Not only does she lose her voice, the sea witch actually specifically cuts out her tongue. Uh, so it's kind of a... How? And you're going to object to what I'm about to say, and it's not my idea, but... It's kind of a crap castration. So whose idea was this? Freud. Like, he didn't say specifically, but, I would but, not have like, guessed. Hans Christian Andersen, in at least one letter he wrote to a man, described himself as wishing that he could be a woman so he could know this man the way a woman might. Something along those lines. And he could sort of interpret it as sort of this taking that longing, that pain, and making something out of it, even if it is tragic. Uh, no, no, that... That bit, like, I'm totally on board with. That makes sense. Uh, you know, it fits with Hans Christian Andersen's own experiences, and even if it didn't, it's a perfectly good interpretation by itself. Um, I'm just like, at what point is being castrated, like... If anything, gaining the leg seems like it should be a sexual awakening, in that she literally gains the ability to have a sex. Look, just take, like, take out a loan, a student loan, and go to undergrad and major in English. Then get your master's in English. And then maybe even get a PhD in English. Become a professor of English, and then you will understand. I feel like I could get there faster with some LSD. Cheaper, too. <laughs> Listeners, for, for reasons that I've not been able to discern, Chamomile thinks that I have a thing for werewolves, and I don't know where this idea is coming from. I've told you, I like a good twink werewolf. And then you get, like, uh, the goddess Ron from uh, Norse mythology, who's, I think, was she kind of a giant? I don't remember. Uh, but she lives under the sea, and she cast her net to drown sailors and in Scottish folklore uh, if you are a girl and you have a brother who is a sailor uh, you're not supposed to comb your hair while he's at sea 
because it would attract sailors. It would attract mermaids to his boat and they would uh, stick the boat and drown him uh, through a form of, it's like sympathetic ma magic because mermaids spend all their time combing their hair. But you are, you do have male versions of sort of like the seductive and dangerous water creature, like the uh, Scottish Kelpie or the Norse uh, Fossagrim, which I don't know if that's how it's pronounced or not. Uh, the Fossagrim is always a guy in like a waterfall playing a violin and he's nude and he will drown you. <laughs> Why are then, you know, why, why, why are the sexy, naked, magical people never just friendly? It's really disappointing. Like, how come no one is ever happy just to show off for the mortals? Does your heartless have anything to do with you as a person, or? I it doesn't particularly seem to. Like some people, their heartless is like literally just them with spooky eyes. But then, you know, other people, like uh, that random villager we saw get turned into a Heartless in Traverse Town, and he turned into a Soldier Heartless. Uh, and, you know, maybe he's a little bit more badass than he lets on, or maybe getting turned into a Heartless gives you a bit of an upgrade. But yeah, generally speaking... Uh, certainly, the, the plot importance or personal badassery does not seem to equate to what kind of heartless you turn into. Maybe it has to do with, like, how much darkness is in your heart or whatever. So, like, if you're a real asshole, you turn into a hell of a heartless. If you're basically a cool person, then you turn into one of the shitty mooks. Which, by the way, you know, I'm just kind of leaving those flowers. Like, I heard someone come by and drop them off in front of my door. That was, like, 45 minutes ago. I'm just leaving them there. That's not going to be a problem, is it? Like, that's, that's kind oh, of okay. They'll in. They'll find their way in. Oh. Normally, I would just, you know, like, okay, we got stuff to do. I'm just going to swim past these guys and find the dolphin. But I can't grab onto the dolphin while there's Heartless around. It prevents me from activating the command properly. Aha! Dolphin. Damn it! So Ariel's combat tra strategy is just hurl herself at the enemy. Uh, yeah, she tries spinning. That's a good trick. She does a barrel roll. Yeah, we tried doing a recording of Arkham Horror, and, uh... We opened a portal to the Nether Realm. Uh, Cthulhu was in the world for a couple minutes. It's fine, we hit him with a steamboat. Why do you have so many steamboats anyways? Like, you're in a landlocked state. Uh, look, you never know when you have to ram a Cthulhu, okay? One of the first ideas... For, we went through so many iterations of the show. Oh my god. Uh, but one of the early ones was there was a, an entirely in-character recording of the cooperative card game Arkham Horror. Um, you know, entirely in character with the characters being ludicrous farces. Uh, we were about halfway through one of the early campaigns they do. Um, the Dunwich Horror themed one, I believe it was. Yeah. And... Uh, the tabletop simulator mod that we were using to record got taken down early on into the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I assume because they wanted to try and, you know, make a profit off of the pandemic. So they had to shut down the tabletop simulator mod, which for the record, I own that campaign. I don't know if I owned literally every card used in the decks... But, like, you know, I actually already did buy this from them. If Requiem lived close enough for me to play in person, he would be sharing my deck. He would not be going out and buying another one. They did not lose a sale from us. There was, there was no version of this where we were going to buy any more than we already had. So, like, yeah. they did probably permanently lose two customers. Yeah, no, like, I, I'm kind of like... You know what? Fuck them. I'm not going to buy any more campaigns. You know, there's a bunch of campaigns I haven't got caught up on. I'm kind of like, yeah, you know what? There's a lot of board games I'm not caught up on. You know, while, while, while everyone else is, like, providing uh, free access to their stuff for, like, a month to help with the lockdown, to try and convince everyone to stay inside, uh, FFG was doing the exact opposite. 